We're very fortunate to have with us again this year, Lee Slavutin, MD, CLU, AEP, letters you don't see together on a business card very often. And uh, Lee is the principal agent at Stern Slavutin 2, Inc. And he's going to talk to us about the life insurance aspects of the Lockwood family's case. Lee. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so a young boy goes to school and uh, he's learning in class about Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. He comes home to his uh, father and says, Daddy, I just learned about where we come from. We come from Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. And the father says, no, 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 no. That's all wrong. This is what happened. We started with a big bang and they developed small creatures and they evolved. And eventually we got into uh, monkeys and apes and we come from monkeys and apes. Boy is very upset, goes to his mother and he says, mommy, daddy says, we don't come from Adam and Eve, we come from monkeys. And the mother says, that's his side of the family. <laughs> okay, so, um, we're going to look at uh, three areas of insurance risk, uh, Kim, uh, business succession, and estate equalization. Let's start with Kim. So she has already got a nice income stream from the charitable remainder trust of $600,000 a year. Let's look at a few places in this plan where insurance would be relevant to protect Kim. Uh, number one, uh, Lou talked about a buyout uh, that Marcus could buy out uh, the interest that uh, Kim has in the slat. And it, for example, if it was done as a promissory note paid over time, it would be important to have insurance on Marcus for that period of time in case he dies during the 10 year note or the 15 year note, whatever it is. So for that kind of insurance need, you would probably do a a convertible term insurance policy, very straightforward. Remember the, ver the most important thing about any term life insurance policy is the ability to convert to permanent insurance, to be able to convert at any time during that policy. So if it's a 20 year term policy, make sure the conversion option is available for the full 20 years, not just for 10 or 15 years. Make sure that you can convert it to any type of life insurance, not restricted. Some companies will restrict the option to convert. Make sure that you can convert partial. If you have a $5 million policy, you wanna convert 2 million this year, 2 million next year, have the ability, the flexibility to do that. That's the most important thing on term insurance, the conversion option. Okay. The, the uh... oh, yeah, right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, next thing is, uh, Lou also mentioned a, a preferred payout to Kim from the company. So that brings up another insurance need, and that is we should have on Marsha a key person policy owned by the company. Again, probably term insurance, although we'll talk about different kinds of insurance on Marsha later, but just for now, let's say it's a term policy. There's something very important to know about key person insurance. If the policy is owned by the company, you have two requirements that people are not often aware of. Any company owned life insurance policy on an employee, you have two very important requirements. One, you must give the, it sounds obvious, but you must give the employee a notice that says you are insured for X dollars, I mean, the, the employee should know this. They filled out an application, but they have to get this notice. If they don't get the notice and you're unlucky and you get examined by the IRS the, and that person dies, the one that was insured by that policy, the death benefit is subject to income tax. You lose the income tax-free treatment of the death benefit on a life insurance policy if you don't give the notice. Now, you don't have to file the notice with the IRS, 
but you have to have in your file that you gave a copy of this notice to the employee at the time of the application, not one year after the policy was issued, but at the time that you applied for the insurance. Also, for the accountants in the room, you must file a form 8925 when the company owns life insurance on its employees. A form 8925 must be filed every year attached to the federal income tax return listing how many employees are covered by life insurance. Okay, let's go to the next area, which is the uh, business succession. Okay, so uh, the first thing in terms, again, the, the insurance focus, uh, this has a delayed reaction. Okay, um, the beat it, the, the uh, benef Beneficiary uh, Defective Inheritors Trust. Um, remember, and Lou mentioned this, I think uh, uh, it was maybe it was mentioned also uh, by other people, um, that the insurance policy in a beat it cannot be controlled by Marcus as the insured. If Marcus is insured by a policy owned by the beat it, he cannot have any rights over that insurance policy. He cannot have a limited power of appointment over that policy. He has a lot of rights in this trust. He's a beneficiary of the trust, but he cannot have any beneficial interest or control over the life insurance. If he does, it's brought back into his estate. So very important in terms of the drafting that the insurance policy is not controlled anyway by Marcus. Um, I want to talk for a minute about the um, uh, buy-sell agreement. If we have a buy-sell agreement, which was mentioned in this case, uh, most likely would not be a redemption, but I want to talk to you about uh, something that's occurred recently with redemption buy-sell agreements. If I have a buy-sell agreement, let's say I have, uh, to make it simple, I have a company and let's say that Lou and I are 50% shareholders in the company. Let's say the company is worth $10 million and I have a, a, a redemption agreement. The redemption agreement says that if I die, my 50%, my 5 million has to be purchased by the company. Usually the company will own life insurance on my life and on Lou's life. So again, $10 million company, Lou and I each own 5 million. We each have uh, $5 million of insurance owned by the company. Now, when I die and the company receives the $5 million of insurance, does that mean the company's value went up from 10 million to 15 million because it received the insurance? The answer should be no, because the company has to use that insurance to redeem my stock. And in fact, you'll see on the slide, there's a case there called Blount a number of years ago, 2005, the company has an obligation to use that insurance to buy out the shareholder. So the value of the insurance is offset by the obligation to redeem the stock. No problem. The company value remains in this example at 10 million. But Connolly last year says the opposite. Connolly says, again, example of Lou and I, the $10 million company, I die, 5 million is paid to the company insurance. The company is now, according to Colony, Connolly, now worth 15 million. They completely disregarded the whole concept of having a repurchase obligation, completely disregarded. Now, there were bad facts in Connolly. The agreement was not respected. The agreement did not talk about the, the liability to use the insurance to repurchase the stock. The agreement did not talk about how the company would be valued and that the insurance would not be included. Didn't All, all the worst facts you could imagine. But in Connolly, the court said you must add the insurance to the value of the company. So uh, in a redemption buy-sell agreement, it is very important that the agreement states specifically the insurance must be used to redeem the stock. It must state also specifically that the insurance proceeds will not be included in the value of the company. And maybe even you would say we shouldn't do a redemption agreement funded with insurance. We should do a cross-purchase agreement where Lou and I would own insurance on each other's lives. Uh, one more thing in terms of the business succession, and that is on Marsha, uh, a deferred compensation agreement. Uh, we could buy a typically a whole life policy on Marsha. 
owned by the company. The company owns the policy. The company is the beneficiary of the policy. The policy will build up cash. Usually it's a rapidly funded whole life policy. And then that policy can be used as a source of retirement income to Marsha when she gets to retirement age at 55 or 65. The payments will be deductible to the company as compensation. Obviously, Marsha picks them up as income. Also remember, there's a provision in one of the, um, Mitch was talking about tax law changes. We've had enough of tax law changes, but there was one important tax law change in the last year regarding AMT on corporations. Doesn't apply here, but for large public companies with over a billion dollars of income, it's obviously not the case here, but large public companies, they have reintroduced a corporate AMT after having it repealed by the 2017 Act. Now it's back for large public companies. Okay, so in terms of estate equalization, um, we have a number of options in terms of how we could fund a life insurance policy. Typically we would get a permanent life insurance policy on Marcus so that there would be money available to the two children who are not active in the business. We know that Marsha is going to get the business interest through the Beat It, but we have these other two children, Ted and Carol, in the family of Ted and Carol and Bob. What was, what was, what was the name of that, that movie? Bob and Carol. I got the names mixed up. Right. Bob. Bob. <laughs> Ted and Alice. Okay. So these two children uh, who are not in the business will get some protection or equalization. It doesn't have to be literally equalization. You don't have to give them the same value as Marsha. Not, there's nothing written in stone, but they can have insurance through the beat it. There are three mechanisms that would be commonly used today to fund insurance when you have a closely held business, uh, where, especially if the insurance policy is a large one and the premiums are substantial. One is, and all of them, by the way, all three methods, the beat it, split dollar and premium finance are designed to do one thing. And that is to eliminate or reduce the gift tax on premiums. The beat it, split dollar and premium finance are all designed to eliminate or minimize the gift tax on premium. Think about it. If I have a, we're talking about a very valuable business. If I have a $10 million policy on a 61 year old man, we could be talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of premium. If I have, and also we've said before in this case that Marcus has used his exemption of 12 million, although he'll have a, a bump in January of about another 860,000 because the exemption is going up in January, he'll have another 860, but he's used already the 12 million. So if we have, a, a, let's say an annual premium of $200,000 for life insurance, and he doesn't have an exemption available, and he has maybe a few crummy powers, it's not gonna cover that premium for gift tax purposes. We'll have a substantial gift tax to pay. Most clients would say, forget about it. I'm not gonna pay gift tax. So what do we do? We, the beat it is a solution because the beat it has cash flow from the business. Marcus sells his business interest to the beat it. The beat it, let's say the company's got 10% cash flow on, on value. Uh, let's say a $10 million company's got a million dollars of cash flow and they have to pay 4% interest on the loan. So if they've got to pay on 10 million, 400,000 a year back to Marcus, they've got 600,000 of excess cash flow within the trust that they could use some of that money to pay for the premium. The beauty of the beat it is that I've got the whole structure now enclosed within this trust. I had no gift. It was a sale. The value of the business is frozen. And if the company is successful and has good cash flow, I have the cash flow to service the note. I have the cash flow to pay for the insurance and cash flow for other things. Uh, again, it, it will depend very much on the strength of the business and its cash flow, as Lou was saying before. So the beat it is one way to fund insurance without creating gift tax on the premium. I'm going to skip over these here. Okay. So the second method of funding insurance in a closely held business, whenever you have a client 
that has a closely held or family owned business where they're buying a substantial amount of life insurance and you want to eliminate gift tax, these are the three methods to think about. The beat it split dollar premium finance. Split dollar. I'm not going to go into the details of split dollar, but just to give you a general idea, the idea is that the funding of the policy is shared between the company and the insurance trust. And in this example, you can see there's a premium of $100,000 a year paid by the company to the trust, and there's a $4,000 gift. Uh, measured by economic benefit. This is not a split dollar loan. This is called split dollar economic benefit. There are two kinds of split dollar. This is in today's interest rate environment where we have higher interest rates, economic benefit split dollar will become much more attractive. Previously, we did loans, but in today's environment where the interest rates are going up, this is going to become a much more efficient method of funding life insurance, economic benefit split dollar. Um, the, this is a very typical example, 100,000 of premium, a $4,000 gift, only a tiny fraction of the premium is subject to uh, reporting as a taxable gift. That could be covered easily by the crummy powers because you have next year $17,000 as an annual exclusion for each beneficiary, we could easily cover that 4,000. Remember that life insurance premiums paid by a business are generally not deductible. If you're an accountant, please remember that life insurance premiums paid by a business are generally not deductible for income tax purposes. I gave you there the three situations where they are deductible in retirement plans, group term and employee compensation, but generally they're not. And, and over the last 30 years, I've seen many, many proposals where an accountant will come with a proposal to buy life insurance tax deductibly, um, the, the VIBA, the 419, et cetera. The latest flavor is called an RPT, a restricted property trust. This is the latest gimmick where people are proposing that you can deduct the premium. The IRS has consistently disallowed it, has imposed penalties. There's a case, if you wanna look at the case, man construction company on this very subject. So please don't get caught uh, with life insur insurance premiums uh, being deducted. Okay, so now the third mechanism of funding insurance in a closely held business, beat it, split dollar premium finance. So someone please tell me what's wrong with this slide? <laughs> what's wrong with this slide? Ah, what, 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 who said that? Yeah, 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 that's right. Uh, I did the slide a little while ago, uh, more than a little while ago. I'm using a 2% interest rate. You can't get 2% today. I wish you could. Um, so now it's going to be more like 5%, 6%. And that's why premium financing is going to become less attractive today. It's very, I mean, Lou mentioned this before, it's very important on any finance premium arrangement that you have to go back now and relook at it and see what the interest cost is uh, because the interest rates are going to go up dramatically. Um, uh, so it's still viable, but not nearly as attractive. And that's why I said before that economic benefits split dollar will probably become a more popular technique for funding insurance premiums in the business context. How much time do I have? I don't have a clock. And what time do I have to finish? Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so now um, let's talk about some general due diligence issues on life insurance. Uh, uh, we mentioned before that, the, uh, that both uh, Marcus and Kim have existing insurance policies. We have uh, a procedure, and by no means unique uh, procedure, but a procedure called the life insurance policy audit, uh, in which we look at every existing life insurance policy at uh, things like who the owner is, who the beneficiary is. Today's case is a classic example of the single most common reason that families end up in litigation on life insurance. 
What am I talking about? Why do families get involved in litigation? Yeah. Yeah, the beneficiary after the divorce. A family, the husband and wife gets divorced. Uh, one spouse is the beneficiary of the policy. That spouse remains the beneficiary, not because of intentional planning, although it could be planned that way. Maybe it would be appropriate, but in some cases it's not. The spouse remains the beneficiary. Years later, the insured spouse dies. The ex-spouse is still the beneficiary in the policy, and the ex-spouse is entitled to proceeds. Now, I know there are states that have what's called a revocation statute, that if the husband and wife are divorced, then the uh, and the ex-spouse is the beneficiary, that ex-spouse does not have a right to receive the proceeds. It's not black and white. It's not so simple. It's much better if you do an updated beneficiary designation and you go back to the insurance company and you correct the beneficiary. You do not accept the beneficiary designation from the client because they don't remember what they did. They changed it 10 years ago or five years ago. You've got to go back to the company. You don't accept a verbal from the company. You get a written confirmation of the beneficiary from the company. Make sure it's done correctly for every policy. This is the single, actually, the even cases have gone to the US Supreme Court on the issue of who the beneficiary should be after a divorce. Second thing on the slide about the policy audit is the Comdex score. The single most important factor that a, a client should look at when buying a life insurance policy is the financial strength of the insurance company. And it's not because there's a problem for claims being paid. That's not the issue. Claims almost always get paid. It's very rare that you'll see a life insurance claim not getting paid. Very, very rare. In fact, I've, I've never seen one. I have seen annuity payments reduced on annuity policies when a company got in trouble. I don't know if you remember, some of you may remember Executive Life about 30 years ago, got into trouble with junk bonds and the annuity payout from those annuity policies with Executive Life was reduced by about a third. So there are harmful cons consequences when a company has financial problems, but far more important than the solvency of the company is the cost of the insurance. You have companies, I, I can't really name them because I get into trouble if I do that as an insurance agent, but there are companies today that have stopped paying dividends. I, I mean, I have clients with a company that uh, 30 years ago was one of the leading sellers of second to die whole life insurance. That company today is unrecognizable and the dividends are being either reduced or eliminated on existing policies. So the impact of deterioration in financial strength is not that the claim won't be paid, it's that the cost of the policy goes up because in this case, there's no dividends or you, you've read in the Wall Street Journal, many companies issued universal life policies where the internal costs were increased and the client has to pay double, triple the premium or the policy lapses. A third point on the audit is the existence of loans. Lou mentioned this before. We have clients that have policy loans. I'm not talking about premium financing. I'm talking about clients that borrow money from their policy. What do they do? They borrow 100,000 from the policy. They don't pay the interest. The interest accrues. But now interest rates have gone up and you have many policies where the policy loan interest rate is adjustable depending on what the current rates are in the market for bonds. So if the rates are going up from three to four or five or 6% on those policies, those loans will grow in value. Now, ultimately what happens? You start off with a $100,000 loan, it gets to 200,000, 300,000, 10 minutes left, okay. Um, and then, then you get a letter, the client gets a letter from the insurance company saying, your loan now exceeds your cash value your policy will lapse. Client looks at the letter, doesn't really think about it much and says, that's okay, I don't need the policy. What happens next year? Right, There's a, the client will get a 1099. A taxable income is equal to the loan amount minus the basis in the policy. So if the loan is 300,000 
and basis is $100,000, it's $200,000 of income. Is it capital gains or ordinary income? It's ordinary income. Can you correct it in January when you get the 1099? No, the year is closed. So it's very important when you do this, this is really uh, one of the most valuable procedures you could do for a client. Now, if you're not, I know not everyone in the audience is in the insurance business. Uh, most of you are not. But uh, what I'm, the reason I'm saying it to you is that when you meet a new client, make sure that the agent or broker that you're working with on that particular client has got an updated audit, that you have updated information on every company, on their Comdex score, on whether they have policy loans, on who the beneficiaries are. This is the inventory that we prepare after we collect all the information on the policies, all the, the data points on each policy, so you see exactly what's going on. Um, this, um, let me spend a minute on this, uh, types of life insurance, um, just to give you a couple of points. Um, term insurance, we covered the conversion option, permanent insurance. Um, first of all, the, the question to ask about whether you buy term or permanent is the duration of the need. That's pretty obvious. So in the case of the note that Marcus has for the buyout of Kim's interest, if it's a 10-year note, that's term insurance. If you're talking about estate equalization for the children who are not in the business to be paid out at death, that means you have to have insurance when the person dies. That's permanent. What type of insurance do you buy? He's 61 years old. You would not buy whole life on a 61 year old. You'd probably buy for estate planning, a guaranteed universal life policy. It'll give you the best return on premium in terms of the death benefit that you'll achieve. On the, on the other hand, when you're buying insurance on Marsha, who's 32 years old, you'll buy typically whole life because you're buying it as a deferred compensation vehicle to build cash value. The third type of insurance, which I didn't mention, is variable, which gives you the ability to invest in equity type funds. I'm not talking about index universal life. I don't understand it. I don't like it. And I don't trust it. Sorry about that. Um, Okay, before we go to, uh, oh, let me just uh, one or two points on long-term care, and Peter will talk more about it. Um, today, in the long-term care insurance market, just a few points, basic points. Number one, who is a candidate for long-term care insurance? Uh, in this family, um, would, would you think that Marcus or Kim, uh, probably not, uh, it's kind of marginal. I mean, the, the most people who are going to buy long-term care insurance have less substantial assets than Marcus and Kim do. They're more likely to be in the uh, three, four, five, ten million dollar asset range, not in the thirty, forty, fifty million dollar asset range. Um, and so that's the, the first general point. Secondly, uh, they have to be people who can afford to pay the premiums on these policies. So they can't be someone with a net worth of five hundred thousand. So we're generally dealing with people in the range of two to fifteen million buying long-term care insurance. And today, the product that is most commonly sold is a hybrid, a combination of a whole life or a universal life with a long-term care benefit. The standalone long-term care insurance that we used to sell years ago has almost disappeared. Maybe there's one good company, five minutes, okay, one good company, United of, uh, Mutual of Omaha, that has a, a good standalone policy. But other than that, it's mostly hybrid. Um, and uh, actually, Lou and I were talking about this the other day. Uh, it's also great if you can get a, an indemnity policy, a policy that will pay cash benefits without having to get all the expenses itemized and reimbursed. And there are a number of companies that can provide that type of policy. Let me just finish by giving you some uh, a summary of the, of the, the key messages from today. Um, remember, with key person insurance, the term insurance conversion option is important. Remember also with key person insurance that's owned by a company, you must have a notice given to the employee and the company must file the 8925. Next is the buy sell. 
Remember, on a redemption by sell, you must specify in the agreement that the company is going to use the insurance to repurchase the stock, and the company will not include the insurance in the valuation of the business. Remember, in a beat it, that the, uh, the beneficiary, the primary beneficiary, in this case, Marcus, can have no incident of ownership in the insurance policy, no power of appointment over the insurance policy. In funding insurance for a closely held business, we looked at three mechanisms to eliminate or minimize gift tax, the beat it, split dollar, and premium finance. In today's environment, split dollar probably will be more popular than premium finance. Remember, when you do a split dollar arrangement or you fund insurance for buy sell or you fund insurance for a key person, not deductible, not deductible, not deductible. Lastly, when you're doing a policy audit, which I think is one of the most valuable procedures you can do for a client, look at the today, especially the existence of policy loans, look at the Comdex score of the insurance company and um, also uh, look at the uh, uh, who the beneficiary of the policy is, because uh, today the example of uh, divorce is a, a major problem if it's overlooked. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. If you have any 